like you wouldn't want to actually fight him. You know, if there's like objects laying around, he's gonna swing it at you probably. You know. <laughs> What's up, everybody? It is your friendly neighborhood BJJ podcast, Rafa Sparza, coming to you with another great installment of the Grappling Hour. William Tackett will join us in just a few minutes, but before we get to him, we kind of have a big announcement here on the show. If you've watched us for the past three and a half seasons, we're in our fourth season right now, you know that we always go out of our way to book people right as they win their big tournaments. No other show's really doing that. Yeah, sure, they might get one or two of these people, but we really do the best that we can to assemble them as quickly as possible and to give you the premium content that you truly deserve as grappling fans. The announcement here on the show is is that we are looking to create a subscriber-based version of the show going forward. Now, granted, there's always going to be a free component, but we really, really want to cater to those fans who have been diehards with us, ride or dies, the people who show up week in and week out to find out more about their favorite grapplers. So... If you want to find out more about this very special service, all you have to do is go to this link. It's down here somewhere in the nether regions of the description and sign up for our mailing list and we'll send you some more information about that within the next week. It would mean the world to us because there are no major media players in the grappling space. There is no ESPN deals. There are no uh, Fox deals. We are an independent-based production company so we do our best to always gather those interviews and always give you the exclusive interviews for some of the biggest names in the sport and today we've got a pretty big one so if you like this interview please sign up check us out because i think you'll like not only the ones that we're doing today but the ones that are coming up next week back to william tackett his journey is incredible this kid is one of those work hard kill out there when he's going it's easy to get behind him and i think when you see this interview you're going to put some of the things together that were happening behind the scenes that helped to make him the savage that won the trials after a few times where it almost happened but didn't so what i'm going to tell you is don't go anywhere learn a lot from this kid and uh, see if it doesn't apply to your own life all right thank you guys so much for tuning in We'll see you in a little bit. What is up, ladies and gentlemen? It is your friendly neighborhood BJJ podcaster, Rafa Sparza, coming to you bright and early. That's why I'm wearing a hat. Didn't do my hair. It's okay. Honestly, it woke up. I looked at it. I said, that's not bad hair. It's not TV hair. So I had to put a hat on. I wouldn't get up early for a lot of people, though. I'll be perfectly honest. Most of the time when a guest says, hey, Raf, what do you feel like doing the interview? And I'll be like, you know, when it's convenient to me in an afternoon and you get time zones, you get people who are in different places. But when this gentleman said, hey, listen, I got a little early of a time, I said, hey, better be a good guest. Good news. It is a good guest. It's one of our favorites. He won ADCC trials. Took him a couple times to do it. But there was a consistency in his work. This was his fourth straight ADCC final. And what's great about this story is if you watch the effort, the skill, the precision, you already know he's good. But if you watch the way that he's approached his craft, never letting any of those setbacks get him down by being consistent with his work, one of the most exciting grapplers that we have on the scene, and more importantly, just one of the most respectable athletes there is. When you talk about good sportsmanship, you look at this gentleman. When you talk about the team he fosters, you look at this gentleman. And when you look at one of the bright future stars of our sport, you keep looking at him. And you're also starting to look at his family, which is concerning. Because at this point, I'm now thinking, when they all show up, all these tackets show up at like an ADCC trials, it looks like they're bullying the competition. And frankly, we're going to get to the bottom of this, but we're going to talk to the man who qualified for ADCC this September 
Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back to the show our friend and yours, one William Tackett. William, hello, sir. Welcome back to the show. How's it going, dude? Thanks so much for having me on, and thank you so much for waking up early. It means it's, a lot. It's not that early, but it's early enough where I'm like, oh, I might be off. Yeah, coffee's happening, so <laughs> I'm going to make sure I don't seem like a, a full idiot because when I get you on the show, I have lots of questions, and I want to make sure it's a good interview. And fortunately, you do give a good interview, and you've been doing a lot of YouTube stuff. So where did this all come from? Because I'm seeing you on camera just as much as I'm on camera, and you're not bad at it and it's concerning to me because i don't want you to be as good as me <laughs> well um yeah i've been doing a lot of youtube stuff and a lot of video um different things i've just been trying to you know explore all the different areas and uh, places that i can find success and i've had a fun time recording and editing videos and i've had a good response so i've just kept it up but i first got inspiration just from a few guys that i train with um that also have youtube channels they just were encouraging me to do it because um, apparently like I have a good little uh, lifestyle to to just kind of put up on on social media and people enjoy it. So it's it's been fun and I'm just learning a lot as I go, but uh, slowly getting better and better, but still got a long ways to go. You're really good, man. And I want to uh, pay you compliments because it is hard to teach people to be on camera and you look very comfortable. And I think a great deal of that is because you're talking about jujitsu, but it's so welcoming. Like when I watch your videos, you're so pleasant. You do a great job of explaining very technical parts of people's games. And I love the fact that you're also watching your matches, other people matches, like giving your thoughts and opinions because a long time ago, I know you're very young, but a long time ago in jiu-jitsu, this didn't exist. We never heard like Hicks and Gracie being like, I'm going to break down my match today. Like that didn't exist. So when you see these future stars like you, who are OGs essentially now, like you're a vet, even though you're still young AF, you're a vet of the game. And you hear this real time discovery of both your jiu-jitsu journey and helping others to better understand what they may be seeing and going through as well. Uh, so it's like a new shared experience to be creating. So I have a lot mm -hmm. of appreciation for it and I think you're doing a great job, man. Thank you. Yeah, no, that's really the base of what I've um, tried to start doing is I just really enjoy um, coaching and I love helping people get better at jujitsu. I find a lot of um, pleasure and enjoyment in seeing someone that really, really sucked when they walked in the door and then now they've gotten better at something and it, they enjoy it. So I enjoy kind of giving back and I find that YouTube kind of helps with that as well. Helps me broaden my, my casting net or my horizon of coaching and I like it. It's cool, man. Yeah, you definitely... Uh, get more than just what's inside the confines of your uh, gym. Like, cause you know, there's only maybe 20 people you might be helping that night, but then worldwide you might be helping a lot more people. So that's really cool. And I want to compliment you because there was something gross that was happening. You win trials. And then I immediately see on your Instagram that you're teaching one of the like, I think it was like a Friday night class or something. And I said, this kid just went from winning trials to being like, hey, uh, new folks, I'm teaching the new fundamentals class. And I go, if you just won trials, I'd probably, one, take some time off. Two, wouldn't look that excited to teach fundamentals. And three, I hope these students that you have are like, man, they may not know anything, especially if they're new kids, but it's like, hey, he kind of won like this giant thing, guys. So you better show up because like the technique is probably going to be very helpful. Yeah, and we, and we ended up actually just working some basic guard breaks because uh, it was a beginner class. So just white and blue belts. But those are actually kind of the groups that I like to teach the most because everything you show them is really mind boggling. You know, <laughs> um, it really helps helps their game, uh, regardless of really what it is, as long as you're showing them stuff that works. And I find that that's just really fun because you get like the sense of, oh, wow, I'm actually making a difference in, in their jujitsu and I'm helping them actually get better versus just showing them something as like maybe you show a purple or a brown belt something and they discard it because they've already learned like, you know, 100, 200 moves, you know. <laughs> now, I see this in the background as we're talking and I didn't see it at the beginning, but you know, the placement of it is well kept. I do notice the ADCC uh, gold chip which is probably the only uh, poker chip you will probably have in your time. I don't know you as a gambler, but if you are, tell me. Uh, I have to ask, what did it feel like to finally win? 
man, it was so surreal. Like probably actually definitely, definitely the most just immense and emotional moment of my life. It was really, really cool because I've just worked so hard for it. And I know it's not like the, the end goal or anything. So I just can't imagine what that's going to be like, but it, it was definitely a step in the right direction. And I feel like for a long time, I've been just treading in the same waters, you know, trying to uh, win the trials, trying to, you know, get to that top tier. And, you know, once you make it to ADCC, you need technically now made it to the top tier because it's the top 16 guys in the category. So it was pretty neat to finally get there. And especially after, you know, missing it a few times. So, and, and to make it in a pretty, pretty, um, I wouldn't say spectacular, but a, a pretty dominant fashion. Like I didn't win by uh, a controversy or, or um, by decision or anything. I was able to actually go out there and, you know, fully punch my ticket. So it was pretty neat. I mean, and then my team was there. Uh, you know, straight after I got my hand raised and I was getting greeted by my brother and um, my teammates and my coaches and then and just everyone just swarmed the mats. It was just really, really cool. I have to ask because it's easy to get discouraged by results and there is a statistical anomaly to making into that many finals. Like, doesn't happen for everybody. So I know mentally... It's that weirdness of I'm so close and yet it just isn't happening yet. How do you attribute a mental game or what is it that you're doing that is keeping you on the task in a healthy and, and supportive and good way? Because we've seen what happens when people get too drug down on like, man, I didn't get the results. It can actually affect their game at times. So how mm -hmm. were you able to stay both positive and consistent with your work? Yeah, well, I think we see that all too often. You know, people go out and they compete and they get discouraged when they don't get the result. And for me, it just makes me extra motivated. Um, I think it's just all in the way you look at it. And, um, you know, it's partially just the way you're, you're wired and the way you were raised. But I find that whenever I don't do something or I'm not able to accomplish something, then that just makes me want it that much more. You know, I have to, okay, I didn't work hard enough last time or else I would have got the results that I wanted. I need to change some things and maybe do some things more, some things less and, and move, move forward. You know, um, it's always that one step forward or one step back, two steps forward. You know, if I, if I get knocked back a little bit, I got to figure out a way to go a little bit further to get what I want. You know, if I can't reach it from here, then okay, I've got to do a little bit more work to where I can get a little bit closer and then, then I can reach it. So, you know, after the first time I lost, it was like, all right, come back. And the next trials is coming up soon because I lost at the first East Coast. And I was like, all right, the next trials is coming up soon. We just got to um, just train a little bit more, get a little bit more um, experience in the rule set. And then I did really well the second time I competed. And I, uh, you know, got submitted by John Combs in the finals, but it was a great experience because I beat a lot of actually high level guys. And that gave me just a little bit more confidence. And I was like, okay, trials is now a year and a half to two years away. And now I just got to really buckle down and get ready because I, I know that I can hang with these guys. I just got to get ready. And then, you know, I lost again to Cade. And that was that was really like, oh, man, I was so close because I lost by split, uh, decision in the overtime round. So uh, that, was, that was really not discouraging, but it was very disappointing. And since I was disappointed, it was okay. I don't want to get this feeling again, you know, like I got as close as I could have without winning. So now I just need to work a little bit harder and then that will give me the, the, the tipping point that I need. And it ended up paying off. So it did. And again, it, it, there was something super wholesome quality about seeing you and Keith, like a very similar journey of like both two of the most respectable guys. Like, obviously we love you guys, but it's so important to me when I see people who aren't just nice and, and polite and, and well-mannered, but like do good work, compete with their hearts. And to me, there's something even more valuable in the way that you both conduct yourselves uh, as athletes and, and as grown men that I go good for these guys. Look at them. Like they're the people you want to root for. So when I saw the two of you guys right next to each other, I was like, 
they're the only ones who can kind of speak this language about this particular journey. So was it kind of cool to have somebody else that you looked at and you're like, damn, dude, you got a whole bunch of finals too. Like, and you're a pretty good guy. Uh, mm -hmm. Was that anything that was uh, special to you? Because I've interviewed Keith and he was like, you know what? It was actually really rad to be next to somebody uh, and, and share that journey, even though they're different, but still be like, oh, this is cool. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. I mean, the first day and even part of day two, of course I was, I wasn't rooting against Keith, but I was hoping that my youngest brother or not my youngest, um, my younger brother, Andrew was going to, you know, hopefully make it through. And then we could be also both going to ADCC. But after he lost to Damien, uh, I was like, all right, well, I hope Keith takes this, you know, I, I, nothing against the other guys in the division, nothing against Damien at all. Cause uh, Damien's an absolute beast and a uh, super nice guy. And we've been friends and nothing against anyone else. Uh, or Adam or any of the guys, but Keith has just worked so hard for it that if I wanted to see anyone else win it besides my brother, it's going to be him because, you know, he's on the kind of the same route as me. He's, I think we've competed in the same amount of trials and he's gotten three silver medals and gotten pretty much closer and closer each time. And because uh, the first time he, he lost pretty significantly to Ethan and then he lost also very significantly to, to Nikki and then he came back and, you know, he didn't lose like super like super significantly to Cole. It was just by, by um, you know, um, like one major mistake. And now I was like, okay, I really hope that he goes out there and he does well. And he was looking really good. You know, he submitted um, he submitted uh, the leg locker from B team. Um, no, why can't I remember his name? Um, Robert Deagle. He submitted Robert w with an inside heel hook, which was pretty amazing. And, you know, he submitted a bunch of really tough guys to get there. And then he beat Damien. And I was like, okay, well, I really hope he takes it. And he did. So it was really cool to see him, especially his reaction. You know, yeah. he, you can tell that he really, really has worked a lot, a lot and worked really hard for it. So I, uh, you I know, not likened, a lot of more people. I've likened sometimes Keith's reactions to being a Muppet in human form. <laughs> that was definitely something where I was like, yeah, this is pretty adorable. Look at this man. Like his just jaw just drops and he's always like bug eyed. And I go, you know what? That's his happy face. That's him. That's a real reaction from a, a human being. I love it. And uh, compliments to your entire family, man. It is so interesting now to look up on the board at any time when you're watching eight screens at one time and you'll see like tack it. And I go, wait, which one? <laughs> and then I start having a moment. I go, what division are we even in? Uh, but all three of you were putting on really, really awesome performances. It's, it bodes well for their futures. You know, you mentioned uh, your brother uh, losing to Damien, but it was like, dude, that's a good match, man. Like, this is some good, so good stuff, dude. And it's so hard to explain this to the young athletes sometimes because eyes on the prize, as it should be. But the work speaks for itself. When you see him go out there and he's already at this level and you go, man, a couple years removed. I don't know, man. He's got to be one of those front runners coming up pretty mm -hmm. soon. So uh, please pass on my congratulations uh, to the family. But as the older brother, what does it feel like to see your, your younger brothers already starting to do so well in this format? Oh, it's amazing. I mean, to be honest, I thought that Andrew was going to have a better chance at winning than I was. Um, he's, he's just like, so good and so well-rounded um for not a lot of people know but after the overtime with damien because you know the cameras got cut because they <laughs> were going everywhere you know <laughs> but after the overtime with damien the refs was like we don't want to pick a winner and mo was standing right there and like we don't want to pick a winner we should do another overtime round and mo's like well we don't normally do this but ask them if they want to do another overtime round because normally they just make them do another overtime but since it was a trials and they had like you know three more matches after that they were like okay we'll ask them so they went up and asked andrew and damien if they wanted to do another one and they both were like so exhausted <laughs> that they both <laughs> said no and since they both said no, they basically just drew a name out of a hat. And they said, okay, we're just going to put Damien because we feel like he initiated more. And, um, you know, I, I do agree that he did initiate a little bit more. But it was so close that there was just, you know, no way to decide that winner. So that's why they, it was extremely close. So Andrew could have easily been going into the semifinals and going against Keith. He could have been up. So I, I was really happy the way he performed in his camp. And um, not as much for the, the tournament because I feel like he could have won. Um, but I still think he did really, really well. And Caleb Tackett, I mean, 
he's he's a beast he, as you guys can see i've been saying <laughs> it for a while he's a little tank and he's the strong he's stronger than me now and you can tell because he's like throwing literally throwing around the other adult men and you know the, of course they're only like 140 they're cutting to 145 pounds so they're not big men but they're still men and he's yeah. tossing around it's only 14 <laughs> so yeah seeing that look on his face i'm like Dude, you guys have a, like a, a Tasmanian devil brother that I'm looking at. And I go, that's terrifying. And yeah, man, I just know as somebody who I love my family uh, very much, I just know the beaming pride that you have, especially being the older brother, like seeing them going out, dividing and conquering. It does almost border on bullying, though. Like it looks like mm -hmm. you guys are coming to bully the whole bracket. Like <laughs> when I look at it, I go, this is... This is almost offensive. Like, God, they're doing so well that uh, I'm afraid for other people's health at this point. But uh, I <laughs> yeah. was so happy for, for your family. Thank you. Thank you. And I really appreciate that. Yeah, we um, we got a lot way, long ways to go still, you know, obviously. But um, we're having a fun time while we're doing it. And we're just trying to you know do it the best we can and keep giving the best effort we can and, um, you know, hold ourselves in a way that we can at least – it can maybe inspire a few other people to do the same, you know? I hear that, but then I also hear Caleb say that he wants to suplex, of all people in the division, uh, your brother. <laughs> and then I think to myself, what's William's reaction to that? Because it's pretty funny to us when we watch it. But I'm like, do you have to come in and be like, hey, I'm the older brother. Act right on the interviews. Or are you just like, that's nah, pretty funny. <laughs> No, I, I laugh at it. You know, I've seen, <laughs> I've watched their rivalry for however old Caleb is now, 14 years. So um, ever since Caleb was born, Andrew's always picked on Caleb. And I don't understand why, because I've never picked on Andrew. <laughs> I guess that Andrew just like wanted to have that older brother like bully or whatever. Yeah. So he um, would bully Caleb and pick on Caleb. So he just turned Caleb into this monster that he is. So <laughs> it's, I mean, it's coming back at him now. You know, he doesn't pick on Caleb anymore because Caleb's now to the point where he could like legitimately hurt Andrew <laughs> if like they got in a fight. So they just don't, they don't mess with each other much anymore. But yeah. I will say the first reaction when I saw that was I laughed really hard and then I got real scared because I go, ooh, the future is now, my man. So, uh, yeah. Andrew, you know, enjoy it while you can, dude. But I don't know how much longer you can uh, you can bully around this kid. It looks like he's starting <laughs> to fight back and really well. So, uh, oh, yeah. yikes. Yeah, there's no more um, – like he can beat him in training. Like yeah. Andrew can beat Caleb in training. But, like, I mean, Caleb puts has so much just – like, uh, like bull built yeah, up yeah. inside of him. <laughs> that, like you wouldn't want to actually fight him. You know, if there's like objects laying around, he's going to swing it at you probably. You know. <laughs> so again, it's just, it's so funny to me. It's one of, I think, top all time uh, flow grappling clips that I've ever seen where I just go, all right, that's really funny. I was like, listen, these tackets are now providing humor. You got a whole variety <laughs> show at this point. You're getting good matches. You're getting comedy. So uh, I very much appreciated that. All right, man, let's do a little match by match here because I want to get into the technicality of your your game. But before we do, I always love to ask, what does the tournament look like beforehand? So how long would you consider the camp for this particular uh, tournament? And then also... Uh, what does that week out look like for you? So uh, travel, all that good stuff. So uh, we'll go ahead and start. When do you assign like the camp starting in your head? So normally if I'm having like a lot of tournaments periodically, I'll do four week camps because I'm normally staying in shape and I'm going from one camp straight into the next. So I'll have like, you know, a week or two uh, break in between camps and then hop right back into a four week camp. But for something really important like the the trials or definitely the worlds, I try to do a six week camp. So I'll have like a large break before I do the camp, maybe like four to four weeks, and not like break is in not training, just break is in like not competing and not like tearing up my body every day. Um, and then I get into a, a six week camp. So um, I, I try not to do more than six weeks because six weeks camp normally starts breaking down my body towards the end of it. Um, so normally after six weeks of training, that's pretty much all I can do. I, I don't think I could do much more of that for a camp or else it would, I don't think be as beneficial. So I normally do six week camp. That's what I did for trials. And um, I found that that's a pretty good recipe. 
That's very good. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the going into the week of ADCC trials now. Uh, you know, obviously you're somebody who's pretty good about maintaining your weight, so I'm sure that's not a huge issue, but what does travel look like? What does it look like, especially when you get to the scene? Because you're used to this competition experience, and I'm sure a trip to Vegas isn't the world's most taxing trip for where you guys are located, but it is still the little bit of a either drive, and you guys in particular, you're flying there now, which awesome, but mm -hmm. it still does not take away the hard work that you got to do to mentally and physically get ready for a tournament like this. Yeah. So, um, most of the time, like the week of, it's just me working, worrying about my diet, making sure I'm cutting out the right amount of calories. Cause I do cut weight to make 77. I normally walk around about, um, 185 pounds and I cut to 77 kilos, which is 169. And, um, so I do make sure that I'm cutting weight still. I am um, making sure that I up the cardio, throughout that week but low low intensity and no, low impact so a lot of like maybe treadmill or not treadmill um, elliptical machine like like bike stuff like that just to keep my body moving a lot of walks and um, cutting the calories out not too much training because the week of i need to recover and you know i just had a, a, a pretty tough camp recently so i'm i'm making sure that i'm recovering doing everything i need getting as much sleep as i can um and then, you know, as the days get closer, we normally leave for at least trials. We left the week or the day before. So we flew out Friday and um, it was nice that we got to fly because driving is just, oh, it's so tough. You could be stuck in the car all that time. And, um, you know, but most of the time that's all we can afford. So we just end up driving out. But we flew out this time and um, flew out with my friend and then uh, got to Vegas and then just made sure we were cutting weight all day Friday, just making sure we were, um, you know, water either water like finishing the water load by now cutting out the water and whatever it may be and then we'll wake up saturday if we need to cut the rest cut the rest and then weigh in saturday and then uh since it's pretty early the weigh-ins around like 6 a.m i think it was then we can eat and hydrate and then maybe take a nap and then it's game time awesome man and it's weird i feel like for you there's a little bit of an excitement as well going into that day of trials because yeah, sure, you've been there, and yeah, sure, it can be discouraging if you don't get the exact result you want, but that maybe you've had some close taste to it, but you seem like somebody that's like, all right, cool, now I get to show what I do, and I get to be in my element, and I'm sure now it's becoming to the point where you, you have this good experience, so of course, that's a good vibe, nothing wrong with being the number one seed, but that means you get the buy the first round. So it's kind of this, oh, I'm excited, I'm excited, and I got to wait. Yeah. So what does that look like right before you go into that like first match? Because it is a little bit of time. Yeah, I mean, I'd rather take the first match, to be honest. Um, that just gets kind of the nerves out of the way and, and um, helps me blow out my lungs a little bit to where I'm, uh, everyone, you know, everyone that competes always says, oh, I got the first one out of the way. Whew, we're good. So that's what I was. Uh, I enjoy doing most of the time. But having the buy now, you have to fight someone first round that already won their match because they didn't have a buy, and they're already warm. And it's later on in the day, so you've been waiting around for a while. So first match match is always a little bit nerve wracking. But once you get past that, then it's it's um, normally smooth sailing as long as you don't encounter anyone too too tough. And what's really great about your journey coming in on this one is is that you made a, a brief mention of this, and that it wasn't a controversial sort of a approach on how you won. Like it was pretty straightforward and most people would agree things were going well. The biggest way to do that is to get some missions. And you talked a little bit about being on a streak. I was seeing a similar sort of focus and effectiveness in what you were doing in your trials run, because it's always great when I see you in assassin mode. I saw it even at East Coast Trials where I go, man, this kid's on fire. It's looking real good. And you don't want to over-exaggerate or, or get too excited, especially when I'm watching here from the comfort of my couch. And I go, that's good. Go work, kid. Let's keep it going. Because I'm rooting for the big result. I'm just like, mm-hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. Nope. He's super dialed in. So let's start by talking about that first match uh, that you start off on day one. And uh, you get a submission after about a good four minutes in that one. So talk us through that match. Yeah, and right before I talk about that match, I wanted to piggyback on a point you just made about like 
being extra dialed in and extra focused. Um, it's something that I'm really happy about now because it's hard to do that every single time you compete when you compete often. And, but then it's hard to get to the place where you can compete less if you don't compete often. So now I'm finally to the point where I've qualified for ADCC. So now I can focus on like competing less, maybe, you know, a few times a year versus a few times every other month, you know, or every month. And that becomes a lot. It's hard to like get extra focus during camp, extra focus day of, and have that killer mindset every single time. It's just something, not something I struggle with, but it's just something that's a lot harder to do than whenever you have a tournament that's building up on month's end and you can really put your focus into. So for trials, I felt that, both trials. I took a good amount of time off before East Coast trials and I really got dialed in you know, with my brain, my, my mental, my, my, my physical. I felt really, really good and I felt that performance out there. Same thing for this one. I took all the time off from East Coast straight into West Coast. Felt really, really good going in. And um, yeah, it went off. It you know it paid off. I was able to really be like you said, kill mode. You know, <laughs> it shows, dude. Because it, again, you, Keith, similar, uh, it, Brianna, just the smiliest, nicest people off camera. But man, when I see you guys there, I go, they're in their Terminator mode, and <laughs> it's where you need to be. It's just I'm not coming up doing shtick or jokes to that William Tackett. I think I'm going <laughs> to talk to him when he is dialed down a little bit, but it's an appreciation because I know how tough it is to mentally be in that zone. It, it takes concentration. And what I love hearing from you is that you've now found a way to uh, be more mature in how much output you're putting in there. And that is a very difficult uh, balance to have because you look at somebody like JT Torres and you say like, hmm, I don't really see him compete all that much, but he's not the lazy type. He's working on something in the factory, huh? Because now it becomes, he's going to be uh, showing up at ADCC or, you know, he's waiting to show you what he's been working on, on a big platform that you say, ah, okay. Yeah. He wasn't doing nothing. So now you're learning how to make, your time really count when we see you uh, because now you're, you're still cooking up stuff uh, over at your gym, you're in your lab, even when you're talking on your jiu-jitsu tutorials. But what's really cool now is, is that we're seeing you get to know, okay, this is my showcase. Like this is where I get to put all of those techniques uh, to use without killing my body at the same time. So mm -hmm. that's a, that's a exactly. real good maturity. So yeah, let's get into that match, sir. Yes, sir. First match um, against another level black rep representative. So that's my sponsor. You guys can check him out. Um, really, really great apparel and uh, limited drops. So you could definitely have to hop on those as soon as they drop. But I um, was able to get a match against uh, another guy that represents level black. And we had a pretty fun, entertaining one. He um, started off with a little bit of wrestling. I, I was able to take him down and get past his guard. We ended up getting back to the feet where he threw up uh, attempt on a flying triangle and I was able to shake him off and then uh, work back into getting my guard passing going and towards the end of the match I was able to secure some points to make sure that I you know wasn't gonna get scored on last second and then I was able to sink in a reverse triangle and uh, or inverted triangle and then finish him with that and that's how the first match went. Yeah, I, I think I almost recall, I don't know if this was the exact phraseology, but it was the one that I took away, which is uh, level black on black crime, which uh, <laughs> I laughed pretty hard at because uh, your sponsor is very active and man, have they picked some great athletes, you know, obviously you being a part of that no brainer, but still very cool to be in that company of uh, those guys because there were some great performances from the level black athletes. So compliments to them. I definitely want to make sure that's acknowledged because uh, it's hard to sponsor people, but it is dope when those people are pretty consistent at what they do. And, mm -hmm. uh, that was something that I saw all throughout the tournament. So that's going to make you feel pretty good. How many of these matches are you supposed to have on day one? Is it just one or was it, uh, I'm not, not, not just one. Was it just two or was it three on day one? It was just two because I had the buy. So my second match was, hmm, let me think. 
I'm trying to think of who it was against. Okay, it was against a guy, an MMA dude, longer hair. I forget his name. My bad. Sorry. Uh, Zindler. But, um, it was that uh, the Zindler match that you had coming up next in that one? Yes, and you know he's fought on combat jujitsu. You know he's he's a competitor, black belt, and um, he ended up uh, jumping close guard really early. Just kind of ran at me and jumped close guard. And I could tell right away he was trying to stick me in some form of rubber guard or some temp plan system. So I immediately just made sure that I had good head positioning. That's normally how I'll shut that, shut close guard down is keep my head under my partner's chin. I find if they can't get their the back of their head up off the mat, then they can't start to you know set up triangles and all that other good stuff. So I just kept my hands in his armpits and kept my head under his chin. And then um, eventually he, I don't know if he got frustrated or started moving on to something else. So his hands came off the back of my head. So that allowed me to pop up and throw one of my legs up and around both of his legs and hit um, a double outside Ashi <laughs> entrance. So I don't know how else to describe it, but um, I basically trapped both of their legs in between my, my triangle and then I'm able to look for an outside heel hook there. Okay, I have to ask this because I go back to a mentality a lot and – you do all this preparation. Obviously, you want things to go well. But on day one, you have less than five minutes of mat time. How are you able to navigate that, like, hurry up and wait, that excitement, and also saying, like, man, I had a buy to start with. Yeah, I subbed my first guy. That's great. I subbed my second guy. But it just feels like you're barely getting your feet wet on day one, I assume. So how is it that you're able to, to maintain that same level of energy, especially all things considered for your family, that I'm sure you're also observing and seeing your your teammates and your family compete where you go, man, this is a lot to take in. But for you, about five minutes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it actually kind of worked out perfect. I was um, hoping to get a little bit of a longer match on my first match to make sure I'm nice and warm and can kind of just start getting my groove. And I, I was able to go up against someone that I find that um, was my ideal first match, someone that's a little bit, I wouldn't say spazzy, but someone that's very aggressive and wiry would be a better word and allow, allows me to kind of get my game going and, and kind of, I can kind of be a little bit relaxed, but also very attentive, make sure I don't get caught, start getting warm and then start implementing my game. After I get past that first match, then it's just, okay, I'm already warm. I already got my game going. Let's just go out there and get the finish. So I was able to get like that. It was like probably 30 seconds, I think. Um, really quick finish, where which is perfect because then I'm just getting in, getting out, making sure that I limit the amount of time now on the mat and um, can get that back to technically recovering and rehydrating and even getting bigger for day two. So, yeah, what does that uh, day in between look like? Like, is it filled with some food because you don't want to go too much food? Uh, how's the sleep look like? What's the, the group morale as that's coming through? Because, again, good results are happening uh, around you. Yeah, so um, day we're basically right after I weigh in, I am trying to get high fats and some carbs and then just tons of uh, liquid. So I'll normally do liquid IV I found is pretty effective. It's just a little powdery mixture that you mix in your drink. And I'll pound about two of those in about uh, a liter of water, and then I'll drink a liter of normal water. And I'll normally do a bagel with some peanut butter and maybe a banana just for some potassium. So I'll get that down, and then that that's normally what I'll sit on. I'll maybe munch on some trail mix just to get some of that a little bit of carbs and high fats. And uh, then I'll sip on some uh, some carbs. So normally it's like I try to do like dextrose powder, but uh, sometimes I just whatever I can get my hands on. So I'll just sip on that throughout my matches just to keep my energy levels up, but nothing in too much to where I'm like crashing. Well, you're also uh, a huge foodie in that every time I see you put up a steak or something delicious on your Instagram, I'm just short of reporting you on Instagram. <laughs> Like, I'm just short of saying, like, I'm reporting you for uh, a, a crime against humanity. And the crime is I don't get to eat this steak. So mm -hmm. I get really, not jealous, but I definitely, like, there are times when I don't even want steak. And then I see your stuff and I go, oh, God. So what are you eating at <laughs> night? Because, uh, you know, the first day is done. Like, what does that food look like? So at night when I'm done, it's just 
high, high carbs, as much as carbs as I can get and um, low protein and low fat because fat will kind of bloat you a little bit and that's not what I'm looking for. I'm looking for uh, carbs just to kind of put some weight on me and fill up my muscles while I'm sleeping. A little little bit of protein just because, you know, it tastes good and uh, need a little bit of protein in the diet as well. So I normally just um, settle for some like pasta and meatballs is kind of something that I, that's something I went for that night. But um, just any type of heavy carbs, like white rice is great. I just couldn't get my hands on it. We're in Vegas and there's no like, uh, I don't know, I just couldn't find any white rice, you know. Yeah. So I, there was an Italian place right downstairs. I got some uh, spaghetti and meatballs. Ate a bunch of that and then make sure I'm just staying really hydrated with lots of salt just to try to retain some water and stay nice and healthy. So then morning of when I wake up the next day, it's high fat again, low carb, sip on that carb drink, same recipe. Awesome. Let's get into day two now because day two starts off, you have a little bit longer of a match. In fact, longer than your first day of competition, but things end well. And what's always great about you is you do an excellent job of understanding what the score is but still trying to hunt that submission because with 13 seconds left, some people might become complacent with, all right, I've got the points or I've got this. Things are looking good, but you're still looking for that kill. And I think as a viewer, you know, I want you to do whatever you need to do to win, but man, do we appreciate it when we see you just trying to hunt for that submission. It, it does make for a more exciting jiu-jitsu match and uh, it is appreciated. So yeah, tell us a little bit about uh, day two and how that starts. Yeah, so speaking about that match, that was my first match of day day two. Um, the guy is really, really tough. Uh, everyone keeps asking me what was my tough, toughest match of trials, and I keep saying it was that match. And the reason being is because it was the first match of day two, wasn't really too warm, and I went up against just a, a beast, a guy that was just not going down easy. And um, he's an MMA fighter. I heard from someone that he was also a part of Navy SEALs, so he's just a really tough guy. And, uh, you know, he had beat some pretty – Pretty good guys. Day one, he beat Michael Salazar uh, by quite a bit of, by a pretty large margin, and beat two other guys by also uh, pure domination. And I knew it was going to be a, a tough first round. So we kind of gotten a few takedown exchanges first round, gotten a few scrambles early on, and then eventually I was able to pass and find my way to his back. But he just stood up and just started walking around with me on his back. And the last thing I was going to do was to throw in a submission because if you guys understand the ADCC rules, if you have a sub, then you can slam. So I, I didn't want to lock on a, a rear naked because then that was going to happen. Like what happened to Johnny Grippo at the East Coast, he could have you know, maybe tried to spike me. So I was not going to lock on the sub until I was able to get him back down to the floor. So I just kind of stayed heavy on him kept tugging on him, kept trying to lean forward and eventually got him to where he, he collapsed and fell down back to his back. And then I looked up and there was 20 seconds and I was like, okay, well, I got to try to get this sub now. Cause I was hoping to get all subs for the trials. Didn't, I came short, but you know, got it was pretty close. close. Don't, yeah. you know, Hey, listen, dude, I can only give you so much shit about this. Like you were, you were right there. Yeah, it was close. It was five out of seven matches. I got subs, and this one was my, my third match, and I knew I had to get the subs. So I looked up. There was 20 seconds. I just hand-fought like super, super hard and eventually got my hand around his face and uh, was able to lock in the, the rear naked. But it was really tough because he was so good at hand-fighting, so I knew I had to do something. So I made him look to the floor, uh, got to a belly-down body triangle. And most of the time that happens, they have to put their hands on the ground to you know keep their face from being on the floor. So – by putting their hands on the ground, they're not hand fighting. So that's normally what I'll try to do to get the finish when guys are really good at hand fighting. Rock them face down, and then I was able to get my arms around his neck and get the sub. And I'll say this. I think it was so nice of you to not submit everybody so that J-Rod could have that. Like, <laughs> I know that's what you were doing. So no, I'm jealous, I saw man. <laughs> <laughs> well, because you know what was great is obviously he comes out kills it. He's been somebody that we've had eyes on, obviously, because of his brother and how much we know him. But he made a name for himself in a wonderful way. But, uh, you know, you're all chasing that. And that's what's really nice about most of the people who podiumed is, is like, y'all are just trying to get their all subs. And we notice. We can tell. And I think there's maybe a reason why statistically y'all did the best. So it is something that I think is important to tell the people if they're ever looking to try and win a trials. It's like, yeah, you can win by points. Obviously, game the system how you need to game. But, like, 
look at the guys who are podium him. Like, they are trying to give you the finish. So, mm-hmm. we observe it. We see it. We know it. I just want you to understand it's something that is, uh, even though it's not explicitly said until maybe now, we see it. Cool. Well, I appreciate it. And, um, you know, I hope that people appreciate the fact that I try to go for the sub because, you know, it's rewarding for me to go get the sub versus just winning my points because I know that's my job and, um, you know, there's no controversy in getting submission, right? But, yeah. Yeah. And speaking of which, this next match is definitely one that uh, had a lot of people's interest, you versus Ronan, because he's also really good, man. And Mm -hmm. you can always get a good heat check on where a person is when you're like, okay, Ronan and him should be a good match. Oh, oh, that that was really good. Nice job, Will. So tell us about that, sir. Yeah, so I knew it was going to be great. I knew he was going to have a good strategy going in and had probably a good game plan. We had fought once before. Um, we fought the Kasai Pro back in 2019, I believe. Who is it? The the one where they had the, the lightweight tournament with Juni and Meows. And I, I beat him by a significant amount of points. I took him down early off of his guard pool. I passed his guard and took his back. I wasn't able to get the sub, but I you know, beat him pretty significantly. And I knew he was going to have a really tough uh it was gonna be a tough match, you know. Yeah, I've seen him really improve recently. You know, he submitted Giancarlo Bodoni at the um, Emerald City, which is a big win. You know, Giancarlo's outstanding and much bigger. So that was a that was a really cool uh, cool to see him getting really really good and starting to improve. So I knew it was gonna be tough. And then plus, you know, Gordon Ryan's in his corner, so of course he's gonna have a good strategy going in. And you know, that's how it went. He he stuck me in a front headlock early on. Um, actually got fairly tight. It was some weird modification that um, I hadn't really seen up until he stuck me in it, and then I immediately figured out, oh god, this is this is no good. So I had to spin out. Um, ended up giving up my back mid exchange, but um, I, I'm fairly confident in my my positional escapes and my my submission defense. And uh, you guys could actually just to put a plug in. You could check out my BJJ Fanatics escape DVD. I cover escaping the back, which I used in that match because he he put one hook in. And I was able to get my shoulders and back to the floor and escape and then immediately get on his back and stick in the body triangle. Held him there for a while. He was kind of playing, look, looking for this finish, but he was he was shelled up pretty hard. And I remember he was really tough to finish from the back last time, and he shelled up hard then. So I was trying to hand fight and kind of trick him into getting around his neck. until. But, but I looked up, and there was like 20 seconds till points. So I was like, okay, I'm going to not risk going for the sub too hard just yet. I'm going to wait. I waited a few seconds while still attacking and then took my hook out, put it back in, got my four and or three, I think it is for ADCC. And then um, uh, I ended up getting the submission. And if that's actually a really interesting one, because if you guys look back, I went for a arm in rear naked choke for the, I did, I went for it twice, but the time I went before finishing it, I made an adjustment because I did it the first time because he had his arm so high behind his neck, which made it hard for me to get in there and get the choke. But I it made it to where his shoulder was aligned with his neck. So I just locked in a figure four with mm-hmm. his arm, kind of like a, um, like a Dars from the back basically. And I locked it in and started squeezing really tight. And I noticed the first time he defended by reaching down and holding his own leg with a, with an S grip and extending to get his arm back down. And um, by doing that, I thought, okay, I can just you know the, the arm of the figure four, and I can just go up and around his neck and finish him. I tried, and he ended up hand fighting. So I was like, okay, this next time I'm going to do it, I'm going to switch sides. So I, I had it locked in, and then whenever he pulled it down, I just changed to the other side, and that's when I got the, the finish with uh, the rear naked. And I think he was actually going to tap by watching the video. My coach told me it too. I think he was going to tap from the arm in, but I just decided to change because I figured he wasn't going to. Um, but I probably could have finished from there looking back. <laughs> yeah, I definitely noticed because I, uh, you know, I get there sometimes, but I was like, oh my God, he better not finish from here. <laughs> He's just going to make that look too easy. And dude, it looked really tough to be in that situation, but. I I have an appreciation when I can see people do those moves that are harder to pull off in such a high, uh, highly difficult competition. And I, I had a lot of of respect for, for him and, and trying to grit that out. But man, that adjustment was killer. And it was so cool to see you render live time. And as you mentioned, you're like, yeah, I maybe could have gotten him here. But I think your, your experience 
uh, is coming through and, and shining to this point of, you know, what's going to get you the most efficient finish? And more importantly, this isn't where you want to finish. This isn't where you want to be done with the day. So you got to keep that energy uh, to what's mm-hmm. most efficient. And again, maturity, smart, really a great way to play it. So that was a big win. Uh, but then I love seeing this match because Satava is also a trials winner. No slouch. Uh, again, some of the best like X guard, butterfly guard that you can have in the game. So you kind of have an idea of where he can play, but he's very wily. He's got some good stuff. And uh, that was a good match. So tell us a little bit about that one. Because when I saw you get that sub too, I was like, ooh, it's getting there. <laughs> yeah, I was actually really happy I got the sub. You know, uh, John's super tough. Uh, he's had a really close match with Cody. He's actually beat Cody once before when Cody was a brown belt. Then had a close match with Cody last East Coast. He's won the trials. Um, you know, had a good run at ADCC, almost beat Dante. Um, some say that he got robbed, but, you know, just the rules. It, it was close, you know. So he's really, really skilled. Um, trains with Marcelo, you know, has that really beautiful jujitsu, And is a really nice guy. So I was, I was excited to go up there and, you know, test myself against him. And then uh, mid-match, or actually before, before we went, I um, I knew I was I knew when going into it after I beat uh, Ronan that I was okay. I know going into this, I know that I'm mentally stronger than he is, but jujitsu, you know, I don't know about that. Like pretty even. Uh, maybe he might be better. Maybe I might be a little bit better, but not a significant margin to where I'm not going to be able to go out there and just beat him move for move. I know I have to get in there and I have to bully him. I know I have to kind of get in his head a little bit and um, be physical. You know, treat it like you know, a legit match. And um, that's what I did. I, when I went in there immediately, I was trying to win everything from the start, trying to win head position, getting the first uh, initiations off, um, pushing him out of bounds, whenever he would back up, you know, just kind of really being rough with him. And um, since I was constantly battling with, battling with head position uh, on one of the exchanges where um, he flipped me on off of one of my takedown attempts. We collided heads, and it actually uh, cut his eye open. So after that happened, I was like, "Okay, I know this is definitely probably getting in his head a little bit because you know if you're if you get cut open, you're like, oh, this sucks. Now I got a cut. You know, I knew that that was probably happening. It was okay. I just got to keep coming forward, keep coming forward, and um, I eventually forced him to pull guard. Um, after going for a few takedown attempts, you know, I I threw threw up the two on one and shot a double, took him down with that, which he reversed. And then we got back to our feet. I almost hit him with a double overhook lat drop. You know, I was winning the takedown exchanges. I knew if I just kept coming forward, eventually he would either pull or I would get the takedown. And um, he pulled with double unders, which was to be expected because he loves butterfly. And I immediately got good head position. We reset and we reset with me uh, not having good head position, but I was uh, confident that I could get it back. So I ended up getting the head position back and then um, knew he was going to get to X guard, which I've practiced defeating X card for years now. I um, knew I was supposed to go up against another dude from Marcelo's, uh, or not Marcelo's, from Unity. Uh, I forget, he's slipping my name now. Back at the Grappling at its tournament, um, Matt Kaplan's tournament back in New York in yes. 2019. I, I'm forgetting his name now. But a um, really, really tough X card player. And I knew that I was going to have to um, be good at X card then. So I've been working X card ever since, and I was confident. To be able to you know disassemble John's single leg X and X guard, and I was able to do so. And then, right when they were at points, I stripped the X guard off and then hit a smash pass and was able to pass, get to mount. Um, after I was in mount, he had one of my feet trapped, and I knew as long as I just kept that that same head position and kept him from getting his head in close to my leg and recovering, that I was going to be fine. I ended up using the arm triangle to get the back and get that uh, reverse triangle finish. I have to ask here because there was something I noticed uh, after the head collision. Uh, you know, obviously they see him starting to get the Frankenstein badge and all that yeah. sort of stuff. So you take a moment and you go, okay, great. There was something that happened, though, that I observed that I wasn't sure that other people were seeing. But did somebody forget to put on an ankle, a little, uh, little colored ankle thing? Because... When I saw that happen, I saw you being like, oh, right. And then I think I saw you put it on the ones that tell you uh, the different athletes, like the red colored athlete. And I go, mm-hmm. wait, did they let them go this whole time and they didn't have that on? 
Yeah, I think so. I think that um, I had to go crawl over and put it on. I think I forgot to put it on earlier, and they didn't catch it, but it ended up working out. We look it fairly was, different. He's got long hair. I was about to say, I was like, <laughs> we should know the difference between you two at this point, but I just laughed because it seemed like after the, the collision, it was like, oh, what a great time. I got, I got this. Don't worry. I'm going to go ahead and put this on because... Here I am so invested in this match. Uh, you know, he's a friend of the show as well. So I'm just like, oh, okay, this is cool. Oh, no. Okay, I hope that collision's okay. I hope he's all right. All right, they're starting to attend to him. Does William not have his ankle on? Who didn't catch that? Yeah. Is that his fault? Is that the ref's fault? I think it's the ref's fault. Anyway, yeah, back to the I match. Yeah. <laughs> it was fun, though. It was, it was a great match. You know, um, thankfully, he didn't get cut too bad. It was just yeah. a minor collision. It was like my side of my head to like underneath his eyebrow. Um and he was all good, but uh, it was really cool to get the finish against him because I can't really. I think the last time he got submitted was Dustin Akabari when he did that flying arm bar on um, John, and that was a long time ago. So yeah, pretty neat to get a finish over someone so high level. Absolutely, and again, as you get closer to the end of the tournament, you're starting to see things happen a little bit more. Like you know, you've been here, but it does probably feel good. To be back in that, like, all right, we're in the semis, we're close. Uh, obviously, in your next match, you had an opponent who was really doing well. And I thought, uh, you know, if there's one of those star performers, I was like, dude, yeah, he's killing it right now. Like, he's somebody to watch. So that's got to be good. Um, tell me a little bit about your feelings as you're going into the semifinal. Yeah, Chris Wiocek. I, can't, I don't know if I'm saying his last name. Oh, I don't, I don't but... pretend like I know how to say it. So that's why I'm just like, your opponent... My yeah. apologies, Chris. I do not know how to say your name. So rather than butcher it, I will just say, Chris, you're awesome. Yeah, Chris is great. Uh, beautiful jujitsu, very similar to my game. Um, he likes to wrestle. He wrestled high school in uh, Pennsylvania. So, you know, he's good to have outstanding wrestling. He's, um, I think, the number one ranked black or brown belt right now in IBJJF. So he has good jujitsu as well. Uh, yeah, outstanding, you know. Um, he he really surprised a lot of people. He fought Cody first round, and we didn't, you know, to his credit, uh, and, and no offense to him at all, we didn't know who he was. I had hadn't seen him compete. I don't really uh, focus too much on the IBJJF circuit anymore because of um, the lack of uh, me competing in that as of right now. And then plus he's a brown belt, so you know, just kind of slipped past our radar. And I mean, we knew it was going to be pretty tough because of uh, you know he beat um, Ramos first round. Ramos is pretty good. And we're okay. Okay, he's gonna be good. And we went out there, and you know, he pulls guard immediately, and has like his feet bent behind his head. And we're like, okay, the guy's a guard player. Yeah, he's a guard player. And um, yeah, he's okay. Yeah, we'll just wait till overtime. We'll try to get some passes going. Cody will try to get his game going. But if not, we can always go for some takedowns in overtime. And then overtime hit, and then we're like, oh, okay, this guy can wrestle too. <laughs> and by the time that happened, you know, the guy was ahead on some attempts and ended up beating Cody by ref decision so it was a really close tightly knit match which, which chris had an outstanding game plan and performed amazingly and like i said surprised, surprised a lot of people shortly after that he beat um kieran uh don't know how to say his last name either could check is that something like that um oh, i'm but, not listen dude okay. i'm not the guy to correct <laughs> Uh, like, go name ahead. <laughs> pronunciations like until just as a, a rule if you're watching this and you're this deep in the show uh until you come on my show i cannot promise you i will say your name right because i tend to try and do the good host thing of how do you pronounce your name great thank you very much but until then it's just me bracing and saying like uh, all confidence, this is how you should say the name, uh, even though I might be entirely wrong. So, uh, yeah, that that's my approach, and uh, I try mm -hmm. not to be disrespectful, but every once in a while I'm like, Oop, this is not going well, and I've definitely done play-by-play uh, -play and, and commentated events where I go, God, I might hear the back from this one, but uh, at least they know I'm not doing it on purpose. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm not great at it either. I, um, I'm also really bad at remembering people's names, and I feel bad about that, but I'm trying to get better. But Kieran, he beat Kieran, and he beat Kieran very significantly yep. too. I don't know if he took him down in the, the beginning of the period, or uh, Kieran pulled guard, but he was able to hit some really nice body lock passes, which um, didn't score 
probably should have. I don't know if Kira's back was completely flat. I was in the process of warming up and, and all that other stuff, so I didn't watch it super closely. But he definitely passed Kieran's guard once or twice. And which was I was like, wow, that's that's impressive. You know, that you don't see that happen often. And then uh just stayed on top, defended all the leg locks, stayed nice and low, kept good head position. I was like, wow, this guy could pass too? Oh, man, <laughs> this guy's good. And then they went to overtime, and of course, you know, Karen pulled because of, uh, he probably, I don't know if he just, you know, it was the beginning of the match until he felt it out or just decided, okay, I don't want to wrestle this guy and pulled. So he got the negative, and um, Chris won by that negative. And uh, so, yeah, leading up to the match, I knew he was going to be really, really good. Um, obviously, if he made it to the top four of, 256 competitors he was going to be legit and on top of that he beat some really high level athletes and beat them significantly too you know it was not super controversial he beat guys by beating them and he looked really solid so i knew it was going to be tough that was awesome man and uh tell us just a little bit about how you were able to pull off that as well like that win yeah, so that was one of, actually, I think it was my favorite performance of the event was my match against him. Um, probably second was against John, just because it was such a, a cool win. Mm. And I feel like I performed well, but I feel like I performed my best against um, Kieran. I wasn't able to get to finish, so it wasn't like uh, the best version of me, but I feel like I was really able to utilize some areas of my game that I haven't been able to show everyone. Um, and that stuff that I've been working on, especially since the last trials. Uh, early on, I wrestled with him from the start. I never, I only pulled guard uh, initially, uh, jumped close guard and got right back to my feet because I felt like I almost had a, a straight arm bar, which I ended up kind of popping his elbow a little bit in the, the standing portion. And then when I jumped, he uh, hunkered down and didn't allow me to get anything going. So got right back to our feet. And from that point on, I just kept wrestling him. And, you know, he's a great wrestler. Like I said, he wrestled high school in Pennsylvania. I've never, um, wrestled in my entire life you know <laughs> i've always been a guard player and i've really been trying to work wrestling and i was able to hit some pretty uh pretty good wrestling moves against him even work some um, some counter counter wrestling and um, get out from some bad positions i was able to hit some nice two-on-one shots take him down twice in the match uh and work some 50 50 stuff that you know i've always been working on and continue to try to develop and um yeah i felt really good in that match you look great, man, and it was a it was a good match. And again, you kind of know somebody who just kind of like has that kind of really really good series of performances. They could be a spoiler. So if you're like, especially the number one seed, or you're the guy who's like trying to win, you definitely are looking to be like, I gotta extinguish this. Like I gotta take that momentum away from him. And I thought you did an excellent job of mitigating that. And again, it just showed what experience it was playing in, in your corner and being like, no, I know the rules. I know what I need to do to secure this win and move on. And I was like, all right, he's playing smart. Now, meanwhile, other side of the bracket, you're looking over no easy feet on that side too, because you got PJ and you got Andy. And I know in your head, you have expected them in some form and especially the type of weekend that uh, both of them was ha were having. But I felt like Andy was definitely somebody that you had to keep an eye on that whole weekend like he's always a threat but he also looked like he was on fire as well but meanwhile pj is like the embodiment of consistency for that that group so you know mm -hmm. that no matter who wins that one it's like all right that's going to be a tough final yeah i mean I, I figured that andy was going to take it not because i felt like pj was doing bad at the event at all but i feel like Andy has a very good game for ADCC in the fact that he's very hard to score on because he's so flamboyant and, um, again, I'm not trying to say spazzy, but very wiry and very um, quick and nimble and you know agile and all these different things that really go well with the ADCC rules. Um, he's got good wrestling. He has really good uh, movement on top. He's really hard to uh, take down. He's got heavy hips, and he just moves a lot, and that's a really tough – um, style to deal with in the ADCC rules. Um, PJ, not so much those things. He's very technical, very strong, very durable, but he's not very quick. He's not very um, like nimble or anything. Not not bad, not bad at all. Like I'm not saying that that's a bad thing. It's just the different styles, right? And the different attri physical attributes, you know? And um, I figured that match was going to go the, kind of the way it did. I, I figured Andy was going to make it to the semifinals because of... Um, the way he had, you know, lined up, he had a bunch of guys that were non-wrestlers leading up, and I was like, okay, well, I mean, 
you know, wrestler versus non-wrestler in ADCC, like, you know, <laughs> no, wrestler always is pretty much going to win as long as they don't make any mistakes on the ground. So that happened. He ended up beating, you know, Majid, a few other really tough dudes made it into the semis. And PJ did looked amazing too. I wasn't sure he was going to make it to the semis, but I, um, you know, was very confident he was going to do well. And, cause, just because he had a tough side, you know, he had to go against AJ, which he looked outstanding against. Um, he either had to go against AJ or John. And I knew that the, that was going to be a rematch between him and John because he he hooked John last time. But I'm sure John's been working, uh, you know, hard on some stuff. But you know, it looked like he had like a like mechanical arm thing going on. So I was like, oh, I don't know how well he's going to do against PJ this time because it looks like he's kind of going out there with one arm versus both. And, and you know, he ended up not making it to John where John fought AJ. Look outstanding, but uh, I figured that uh, Andy was going to take the win on that one just because he's you know, like I said. So nimble, knows. It looks like he knew the rules really well as well, and uh, yeah, he, he looked great. It there's something to be said about momentum in a tournament. Again, especially when you have an opponent that is peaking and that you have them in the semifinals. But on the other side, it looked like Andy was possessed at this tournament. It looked <laughs> like something was taking over him. Like I've seen him go to that place when he's competed before. And again, he's a friend of the show as well. So it's kind of like, no, I'm familiar with his work. Like he's obviously talented and amazing at this. So I know as an audience member, Switzerland watching this thing, like mm, good luck boys. This is, this is a tough match. No matter how you pull it for either of you, like you possess certain things that make it difficult for him and I know that he has certain things that in terms of trying to maintain and control, it is hard with somebody who can be that wiry and that uh, not just nimble, but like his movement has meaning. So when you have somebody like that, it's not just like spazzy or reckless. It's like, no, 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 no. He knows how to use his body really well. And so he sometimes does. learning how to do that is like in real time, you have to just kind of experience it to be able to maybe contain some of that. So I knew that was going to be a great match. And man, the both of you guys, when you slapped fists, it looked like it was an agreement to, okay, murder can happen here. We both want this really bad. And I was so proud of both of you. I thought that it was a, a spectacular match. So many different scenarios could have happened where different things could have happened. But I thought that you guys put together a very entertaining match to watch. Well, I'm happy. Yeah, it was it was fun. I'm glad that we were able to make it entertaining. Um, I knew going into the match that it was going to be him trying to play on the outside and catch me in openings and me try to get my hands on him. I knew that was going to be the the case. You know, there's uh, you might have heard people like John Danher talk about this, but this is a pretty uh, known thing for people that like to strategize and look at people's games, uh, like me. That there's like a multiple types of different jiu-jitsu athletes and there's people that like to really use movement and their physical attributes and like uh, scrambles and stuff like that to their advantage and there's other people that like to use control and um, and like to slow the match down and make it very technical now i wouldn't say that i'm fully a guy that likes to just slow things down and make it technical but i do perform really well in those uh, sides of the match now, I do dwell in the scrambles as well, but not as well as guys like Andy. So I knew that it was going to be a, it was going to be a battle of him trying to create movement and scrambles like he did the entire tournament and like he does in all of his matches, and me try to get my hands on him, basically, and slow things down and start uh, basically putting him in positions where it's us both going forward and move versus move versus me chasing and then him catching me chasing and running around me, which ended up happening a lot of the match. Um, you know, I, the two times that we got a hold of each other, the first time him, him almost him walking up that, that anaconda choke, and then the next time was me scoring. So there was not a lot of like exchange of grips in the match. Like if multiple times, I would try to get two on ones on him, and I think it was partially because it was the last match of the day. We we're all super sweaty, and secondly, he had no shirt on, so it it's just a lot of things go a little bit differently when there's all that slipperiness. And uh, also, he's so good at negating control. 
good at getting out on the outside and moving around. So I knew it was going to be tough getting a hold of him. And as soon as we started going, I was like, yeah, it's even tougher than I thought. <laughs> I just couldn't get close to him. Every time I got close to him, I would grab him and he would slip out of my fingers. And then as soon as he slipped out of my fingers, he was like running around my guard. I was like, oh my gosh. So it was, it was really tough to get my hands on him. And eventually I was able to I knew he was going to try to front headlock me the whole time. So that's what I was kind of planning for. I was planning to try to wrestle with him. And if I took him down, great. If not, I would like land in a bad spot where he would try to front headlock me and I could use it to get to my back, which I ended up did. And um, that's how I was able to pull guard because you can't pull guard in ADCC rules in the start of the match. Not a lot of people un understand that, but in all the other matches, semifinals, quarterfinals, whatever, you can pull guard in any point in any point of the first period. So if it's... Uh, I guess for the actual ADCC worlds, it will be 10-10. So in the first 10 minutes, you can pull guard however much you want. Or I guess it'll be 5-5, five, five, right? 5-5. Five, five. Yeah. You can pull guard in the, any first five minutes of the match. And then the next five minutes, you can't pull. So you, that's when points period happens. You can't pull. But in the finals, when it's 10-10, you can't pull at any point in the match. You can't pull in that first 10. So um, same thing for the trials. That first four minutes, you're not allowed to pull. And um, so I knew that I had to find some way to either get him on his back or get me on my back. So I didn't want to like stay in wrestling exchanges like what happened with him and PJ where they were just kind of keep moving around a lot and then uh, Andy gets the better of him eventually. So I was going to try to get him on his back because if I knew I could get him on his back, I could score. If I knew I could get on my back, then I would be safe enough to just try to score as well. So that's what ended up happening. I ended up shooting early on, getting to my back and um, working my guard getting out of that front headlock, thankfully, and, um, <laughs> you know, working my guard and eventually wrestling up with him, committing to that front head headlock a little bit too much, allowing me to wrestle up past his guard, get my four, and um, that pretty much secured the win because it's hard to come back from a four-point lead yeah. in um, the ADCC rules. I I was going to try to retain top position, but also I'm like, oh, I just won the trials, even though it's not over, <laughs> like I'm thinking that, you know, because I'm up four points and there's like a minute left, and I'm like, ah. So I just kind of like let him get – get out and back on top i probably should have went a little bit tougher and tried to look for the sub but i was just you know everyone's screaming the crowd's now roaring and, and i got all this emotion going on so i probably uh didn't secure it in the way that i should have and i allowed him to get back on top which allowed him to score two but since i'm up two and there's 30 seconds left in my guard i knew i was going to be okay so i just kept trying to come forward come forward and not let him get past my guard because he was coming at me like super saiyan <laughs> I will tell you, I uh, one of my favorite things to do, especially in the very, very out rounds of these things, is watching the ADCC math happen in athletes' heads. So I watched you as you were calculating. I could see your brain being like, mm, nah, we're, we're good. Just don't let him do things that would make that bad so it was just kind of like two points yeah we can we can give those two so i did see that happening with you i was like no nah, he's he's calculating and he this is a smart play and it was really cool um obviously a great match congratulations to him as well for for putting on an epic performance seems likely he might get an invite uh as well uh as a possibility you know i've heard well deserved too you know, and absolutely, and I've heard rumblings, you know, PJ's in consideration as well. It's a murderer's row. Like, there's no easy mashups at that mm -hmm. point, and that's the way it's supposed to be. So that's good. Um, I would like to ask, because you get that moment, because it's, you know, something that was eluding you for a little bit, what was the best reaction that you got? Because so many people know you so well. You've got family members who are competing. You've got people like Cody who are like family. You've got all these people, you know, on top of your own mom and dad and friends and family who I'm sure are just so happy for you. But do you have one memory that just kind of stands out as something you vividly remember from winning and as a reaction from maybe even somebody else? Yeah, I mean, it was the whole time. Like, it was the entire day after that was just so surreal. Like, it was really, really cool. But one moment that really stuck out was like right when I got my hand raised. It was just my my team rushing out onto the mat, and I saw like you know huddled up and them just like tugging me around and us jumping up and down. It was just it was a really cool moment, you know, um, really emotional, really. And like I keep saying, using the word surreal, but I don't know any other way to describe it. It was it just didn't seem real. It was so. Uh, just amazing, you know.
you join a nice company of people who have mentioned that stop of time. You know, a, a lot of the trials winners that we've interviewed, they they mention how things just kind of slowed down, and like you do have a moment of, is this happening to me? Am I dreaming this? Like, what's happening? So anybody who's had those kind of moments in their life, it definitely feels great. So I want to tell yes, you, sir. man, as somebody who's observed you growing up, you know, you're you're essentially growing up live time for a lot of us. We've seen you compete for years, and we've always been very impressed by the way you conduct yourself. But, you know, to see you get a result that you've been wanting for so long, there was some satisfaction sitting here and, and just kind of like, man, look at this kid. He's doing it. He did it. You know, watching people accomplish their goals is the stuff that we hope whenever we're watching these things. So everybody mm -hmm. comes in there wanting to win. Obviously, you want people to win. We have a lot of friends. It's hard to be uh, biased whenever this mm -hmm. happens. But what's always great is when you guys do the work and we just kind of sit there and say, yeah, he did it. Look at that. And, and a credit to you and your team. So uh, we're going to round things. Thanks, You've been brother. very kind with your time. So I want to mention a few things. Uh, first and foremost, make sure that we are following his YouTube channel. Everybody, really good stuff. I mean, this is great free content, beautiful technical breakdowns, wonderful stuff. And it does look like you're taking the show on the road because let's say people can't just uh, get their BJJ Fanatics DVD of yours. Maybe they didn't pick up on the hints that the stuff works. Escapes <laughs> work when they really need to, guys. So if that's the case, where are you taking the show? Well, you, I, I don't think you know yet, but it looks like you're you're taking the show on the road with the uh, One Jiu-Jitsu Seminars, right? Yes, One Jiu-Jitsu Seminars, BJJ World TV, and I are all doing the seminar tour uh, across America. So it's going to be all over the place, taking it on the road, starting in the East Coast, I believe. So um, if you guys have any interest in linking with me and uh, one jiu-jitsu seminars for a tour or, or just a seminar i mean then go ahead and hit them up instagram is probably the easiest way one jiu-jitsu seminars or bjj world tv also uh, you can hit them up as well or me and i can redirect you guys so and as great. somebody who's actually seen you give a seminar like it's good you really like when you were there and i was watching you at the very end of your seminar you were so attentive and nice with your time with everybody who was there. You were answering questions, doing a great Q&A session. Uh, I would never say I have your expertise at all, but I did notice a similarity in the way that we approach Q&As. Because when mm -hmm. the way I, I saw you were like really attentive and making sure like, no, ask follow-up questions. Like you were encouraging the people in that seminar to say like, are you sure you get that? Is there anything I can help better explain? And it was so uh, attention detailed that I was like, oh, I mean, I'm not what he is, but I definitely do something similar. So it was really cool to see how awesome. good of a teacher you are and the teacher I like to try to be. So thanks, uh, brother. Thank was, you. That was really amazing to see, and it, it, it bodes well. So, like, money well spent, kids, if you go for a seminar. Um, last couple questions here, sir. Uh, I want to go ahead and give you an opportunity to go ahead and shout out anybody who helped you get ready for this, uh, as well as any sponsors who made sure to take care of you, because this was a, a tough one. Yeah, I mean, my team, of course, is a, a big tribute to my team, because, you know, without my tough training partners, my my loyal coaches and everything, like I wouldn't be where I'm at. So thank you everyone at Fight Factory here in Austin. Um, thank you so much to my family. You know, my mom and dad have supported me for years uh, and continue to support me and uh, just really push me to reach my goals. My brothers, you know, obviously help push me in the training room and, you know, off the mats as well. Um, yeah, everyone, everyone that goes into it, my girlfriend pushes me, uh, constantly supporting me, you know, it's, it's just, I, the list can go on and on. So I'm really appreciative and just thank you everyone, all the fans and supporters, sponsors. It's just, it really means a lot. And I just can't thank uh, you all enough. And it's hard to mention you all because there's just so many people that go into this. <laughs> all right, here we go. Last two questions. Number one, what can we expect from you at ADCC this fall? Expect for, for me to be the as Lord willing, you know, the most ready that I'll, I'll ever be. You know, I'm going to put in a lot of work for this. This has been my dream for, you know, ever since I've been a little kid. You know, first few weeks of jujitsu, I was already watching ADCC matches. So, uh, 
just expect me to be ready. I mean, that's all I can say. Just expect me to be ready. I can't guarantee any outcome, but expect me to be re- the readiest and um, most prepared I've ever been. And what would a win or winning ADCC mean to you? I mean, it would, it would, it would mean so much. I mean, I would be one of the youngest winners. I'm 20 years old right now, so it'd be fairly young for to win ADCC, especially first time around. You know, I think that might be pretty. That'd be pretty amazing to go out there and and win first time around. You know, I was supposed to compete at the last one. Hopefully, like I was a I was an alternate, but I didn't make it out there because no one got injured, and it kind of bummed me out quite a bit because I was really hoping to get out there because <laughs> I felt like I could have done well. You know, I did like the camp and everything with all the other guys that were competing. So this time it just, you know, just being a dream come true. I have to say, I, I'm one of the few that kind of knew you were uh, in the background, just kind of waiting for your turn. And knowing that watching this, watching your run, it was all the more satisfactory and knowing like, man, knowing you were so close to maybe just being inserted in there and you always hope you never want people to be super hurt, but you're always like, is everybody okay? Cause I'll go <laughs> in there. If you guys want me to, I, I'll do it. Uh, so obviously you don't want it to be under those circumstances, but this is way better. This is you qualifying. This is a recognition of your work and it is something that you have earned. And I say this again, I know it's important to always categorize these things, but it is so well-deserved and it is thank because you, of your body of work and uh there is something to be said so again when i point to those good people who i think do excellent work and have consistent work ethic it's you it's people like you you train with and stuff like that so i'm i'm so happy for you man and i look forward to seeing what you bring because i know you're in the lab and i know you're cooking up something special for this so congratulations you. to you man thank you so much and i really appreciate you having me on the show as always it's great talking with you and you know discussing all things you did too Absolutely, man. All right, I'll say bye to you off air in just a second. But hey, don't you guys go anywhere. We got just a little bit of show. We'll be right back. All right, everybody, that is going to do it for this week's episode. We hope that you enjoyed our first four days of really fun interviews with ADCC Trials winners. We got more coming up next week, four, and they start on Tuesday. But before we get you on out of here, first, our thanks to young Mr. William Tackett. Second, a nice time to remind you guys that, yes, we here have a Spotify channel. You can find us at Grappling Hour on Spotify to keep up with the audio broadcasts if that's where you like listening to stuff. I don't know. Maybe you don't like seeing my face. Totally cool. Don't really care. I have a face for radio, I've been told, by my parents. Anyway, that's not important. Uh, If you want to find out more information on how you can become a subscriber, you like this interview, you want to see more, you like what we did all this week or in the past, just go to the link that is down below here and uh, we will send you more information about that. That's coming up sooner than later, but also coming up sooner than later is next week. We have four more interviews. You won't want to miss them. Really, really good stuff. But uh, that's going to do it for us here today. My name is Rafa Sparza. It's been a great day for grappling. We'll see you back on the mats. Perfect, perfect.